Besides the Bible, only two books were more widely read than the Heidelberg Catechism. To this day, the first question and answer which explains the Christian's comfort in life and death is still the most treasured Christian writing. In 1563, the Heidelberg Catechism was compiled and printed. But there is more to its history. To tell the story of the Heidelberg Catechism, first you must know the main characters. Upon the death of his uncle in 1559, Prince Frederick III found himself the elector of Heidelberg in a time of unrest. The people of Heidelberg were arguing and debating. Conflict between the Lutherans and Calvinists raged with great violence. Frederick prayed for wisdom and searched the scriptures for what he should do. In addition, he wrote his friend Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther's bold assistant, for advice. In all things seek peace. This is done best by holding carefully to a fixed doctrinal position as regards the Lord's Supper and other matters of faith. Meanwhile, summon to your land from churches such learned and pious men as can advise you best when controversy doth arise. Write this down. Zacharias, your sinus. I would like you to come to Heidelberg for a season. I have two reasons. My first reason is that I would like you to teach at the university. And my second reason, and more important, is I have a very special task for you. I am commissioning you to write up a catechism, very similar to the one drafted by Martin Luther. This is a great undertaking. You will have the entire faculty of Heidelberg University at your disposal. Please come soon. Frederick took his friend's counsel and in 1562 commissioned two young men, Zacharias Ursinus and Caspar Olivanius, to write a catechism in Heidelberg. Although she was not involved in the writing of the catechism, Frederick's wife Maria, Princess of Brandenburg, played an important role in the story of the Heidelberg Catechism. When Maria was 17, she met Frederick who wished to marry her. Maria's one requirement for marriage was that he studied the scripture and read Luther's works like she had. In 20 years of marriage, they had seven children and lived peacefully together. But the more Frederick studied the scripture, his understanding, specifically at the Lord's Supper, began to differ from his wife. Lovingly, Maria feared her husband was straying from the truth, but he was convinced the Calvinistic view was correct. Year. When we first met and we agreed to study through the scriptures, it was the works of Luther which finally convinced you against the popes in the Church of Rome. Was it not Luther who convinced you of the doctrine of sola scriptura? Martin Luther is a great man, and I certainly owe a lot to him. But this whole doctrinal controversy that we are experiencing has forced me to re-examine my beliefs, and I found that I am more and more in agreement with the French theologian, John Calvin. I fear that the shift away from Luther's teachings may also be strained from scripture, but I respect your desire to seek out the truth, and I will withhold my judgment on the Calvinists. It wasn't until the last years of her life that Maria accepted the same views as her husband, which made their parting even harder. She died in 1567. For Zacharias for Sinus, Frederick's invitation to help write the catechism couldn't have come at a better time. He was not popular with the people of his hometown. They didn't share his religious beliefs and were hostile towards him. Zacharias was a quiet, peaceful man, so this saddened him. On top of this, his close friend and professor, Philip Melanchthon, had recently died. Although he was unhappy, he initially did not want to accept Frederick's invitation. You wish me to accept a highly prestigious position at the university in Heidelberg, which I don't aspire to. I don't want prominence or fame. I long for, for pleasant obscurity. A peaceful corner somewhere far away from the cares of the world. I'd give anything for the shelter of a quiet village. These are tumultuous times, my friend. Men with your learning and your zeal for the word of God are needed now more than ever. Also, you've written a catechism before, 
which makes you the obvious choice to head this project. With all the theological disputes raging throughout Europe, there's no peace in Heidelberg. If we are to weather this storm, we must not be swept by every wind of doctrine, as the Apostle Paul warns us. I fear for the young people in Heidelberg and throughout Germany, and I wish to see the next generation brought up in the truth of scriptures. Zacharias, don't you also long for the day when the boy behind the plow will be as wise as the kings and scholars as regards to the Bible? I was raised a Protestant. The people in my hometown helped me pursue an education because we were so poor. I then went to Geneva where I learned under John Calvin. When I returned, I, I became a teacher hoping to impart what I had learned to my fellow countrymen. But there was so much anger and quarreling between the Protestant factions that when the mainly Lutheran citizens learned that I was convinced of Calvin's teaching, they practically drove me from my home. I am not suited to the times, but I will trust that God will carry me through. I fear God more than I fear what awaits me in Heidelberg. I will come. At the age of 28, Zacharias knew God was directing him to Heidelberg. In the end, his desire to obey God was greater than his personal fears. Soon after, Caspar Olivanus, who was two years younger than Zacharias, came along to help with the project. After a tragic event in his life, Caspar left the law to become a minister. In Geneva, he studied under the theologian John Calvin and became convinced that the Reformation was God's work. As a preacher, he taught the doctrines of Scripture and refuted the errors of the church. This angered Roman Catholic leaders so much they had him arrested. Hearing of his imprisonment, Frederick paid for the young minister's freedom. He invited him to come preach in Heidelberg and eventually helped write his catechism. Zacharias, I'm unsure how to word the question and answers regarding the Lord's Supper. For surely we cannot concede to the Church of Rome, or the various factions of our Protestant brothers, who maintain that Christ's body and blood is physically present in the bread and wine. Much of the quarreling and bitter controversy of today is of this very doctrine. How are we to help bring peace to Heidelberg without compromising the truth of the Scripture? Scripture commends the idea of speaking the truth in love, and assures us that a soft answer turns away wrath. I believe we can defend our sound teaching of the Word of God and preserve Christian peace. We do not need to lash out harshly or to berate our brothers. Here's part of what I've written down. <clears throat> we err not when we say that what is eaten and drunk is the proper and natural body and the proper blood of Christ, but in the manner of our partaking, not through the mouth, but through the spirit and faith. That is well put. Lord willing, through this catechism, we will help bring clarity to this debate and unity to Christendom. With the help of these two young men, Frederick's vision was possible. Once the catechism was complete, Frederick held a meeting with godly teachers and ministers to examine the new catechism, which they approved. Once it was published, the catechism became popular overnight, but received mixed reaction. Many loved it, others did not. It wasn't long before the Roman Catholics and even some Lutherans began to attack this Calvinist document. Eventually, even the Emperor of Germany Maximilian II got involved in the debate over Frederick's catechism. The emperor heard rumors about this little book and its author, and had questions of his own. He was soon to discover what the conflict was about. In 1566, Frederick had a chance to defend himself before Maximilian at the Diet of Augsburg. There has been a lot of strange talk about you lately, O Elector Palatine of Heidelberg. There are new rumors every day. 
From what I hear, you were either possessed by a demon or else are teaching heresy. These are very heavy accusations against you. As the commissioner of this catechism, you were charged with theological innovations. It is clear that this catechism, and you men from Heidelberg, are upsetting the peace of this land. As your emperor, to whom you must be loyal, I demand that you forsake these Calvinist teachings and cease distributing your catechism. This is my command. Your Imperial Majesty, I continue in the conviction which I made known to you before I came here in person, that in matters of faith and conscience, I acknowledge only one Lord, who is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. His truths I am duty bound to guard. I will not recant the truths in this catechism because they are the very teaching of the Word of God. I comfort myself in this, that whatever we lose here on earth for his name's sake shall be restored to us a hundredfold in the life to come. With this, I submit myself to the gracious consideration of your Imperial Majesty. Because Frederick spoke so convincingly, Maximilian decided not to push the matter further. After the meeting, everyone was impressed by the Elector of Heidelberg, People like this kind and principled man. In a letter to a friend, the emperor called Frederick the pious. Few rulers before or since have modeled such godliness. Frederick trusted God to fight his battles for him. The Lord protected this little book of comfort for us to enjoy today. The three men who wrote the catechism, a godly prince, a shy teacher, and a bold minister, were believers driven by devotion and conviction. They teach us that theological truths are worthy of defending. In history, people live and die. But God's truth will stand forever.